In 1991, aspiring screenwriter Andrew Kevin Walker made his big breakthrough with this screenplay. Four years later, it became the seventh highest grossing film of 1995 and is now ranked number 20 on IMDb's top rated movies. Here are seven screenwriting secrets in seven. In seven, we have two main characters, Detective William Somerset and Detective David Mills. They're essentially together for the entire film. So in order to get the most dynamic relationship out of them, screenwriter Andrew Kevin Walker gives us a clear contrast in their characters. Let's take a look. Somerset is older and single. Mills is younger and married. They use different firearms. They have a different choice of beverage. I'm just gonna get another beer. Beer? Uh, wine, please. Somerset is patient and methodical. Must be something. Just wait a minute. Mills is impatient and hasty. Where are you going? Going in. No, no, wait, wait, wait. This is even reflected in their neckties. Mills lets his emotions get the best of him. Get out of here! Hey! Get out of here! I got a fucking right to be here! Get out of here! Jack! We have to divorce ourselves from emotion here. Oh, no matter how hard it is, we have to remain focused on oh, the man, details, I feel okay? My emotions, how's that? Mills is extremely judgmental. How the fat fuck ever fit out his front door? Wait until the lunatic does it again. It's dismissive to call him a lunatic. Don't make that mistake. Right now he's probably dancing around in, in, his, in his grandma's panties, rubbing himself in peanut butter. Look at Mills' choice of language. Don't jerk me off. Fuck yeah. Goddamn poetry writing faggot piece of shit. Compare that to how Somerset speaks. The sermons were about atonement for sin. These murders are like forced attrition. Forced what? Their levels of education are drastically different. But on their flesh, Merchant of Venice. Didn't see it. The Marquis de Chardet. The Marquis de Sade. Whatever. Check out their different interrogation styles. Mills asks simple yes-no questions. You heard nothing strange. You saw nothing strange. You didn't see anyone. Do you like what you do for a living? Somerset asks deeper, open-ended questions. The girl, the prostitute, where was she? <laughs> Who tied her down? You or him? So if you want to create natural conflict and humor, give your characters contrasting qualities. Detective stories can teach us an effective way of advancing the story. They seem to lend themselves very well to hooking one scene into the next. In the screenplay for Seven, there are many examples of this. Let's take a look. In this scene, the captain enters Somerset's office to alert him of the greed murder. They first set up an expected outcome that Somerset doesn't care anymore. Mills is heading up the investigation. Well, good for him. Then, we get a reversal. The coroner sent this down for you. Found him in the fat boy's stomach. And finally, the hook that leads us into the next scene. They were, uh, they were fed to him. Let's see how this is brilliantly crafted in several scenes. Here, Somerset and Mills look through photos of a crime scene. The trick is to find one item, one detail, and focus on it. Here's the expected outcome. You know what? Thank you for talking this out, but I gotta sleep. Then the reversal. Oh, shit. Oh, wait, wait. Gould's wife. And finally, the hook. I don't know. But that's the one thing. This pattern is cleverly repeated in other scenes. Okay, I need you to look at each photo. Very carefully. I don't see anything. You sure? Please, I, I just, I can't do this right now. Okay. Uh, wait. This painting, it's upside down. Get up, you sack of shit. Call an ambulance. What the fuck is this? Hers would be more like it. Some kind of friggin' wax sculpture or something. You got what you deserved. Hands <laughs> hey, down! Emergency on that ambulance! <laughs> Wait! What are you talking about? Fucking shot at us. Can't go in. No, we can't. We, we need a warrant. Cause. We got probable cause. Okay, man. Okay. You right? Huh? All fucked up.
How much money we got left? I figure one of two things will happen. Either we'll get John Doe, or he'll finish his series of seven, and this case will go on for years. Detective! You're looking for me. Hey! I'd like to speak to my lawyer, please. God damn it! He will take Detectives Mills and Somerset to these bodies, but only Detectives Mills and Somerset, only at 6 o'clock today. Frankly, Counsel, I'm inclined to let them rot. We don't make deals here, Mr. Swar. He says that if you do accept, under his specific conditions, he will sign a full confession, plead guilty right now. Let's finish it. So the lesson here, if there's one thing that we can use from detective stories, it's got to be the scene hook. When you have a story dealing with dark matters like Seven does, it's important to give the audience a varied emotional palette. For example, this film doesn't forget to inject some humor into the story. Subway. <laughs> Lust and envy. Seven, hold on. That's not even my desk. He's a nutbag. And just because if the fucker's got a library card doesn't make him Yoda. Hey man, if I was to accidentally shave off a nipple, would it be covered by workman's comp? Mm. I suppose so. What do you got? Dead dog. I didn't do that. And finally, as in any story, don't forget about humanity. Hey, we got culture. Yeah, we got culture coming out our ass. <laughs> William, I'd like you to meet David. David, this okay. is good. All right, huh? Oh, good dog. Oh, good dog. Oh, Why aren't you married, William? Oh, Trace, what the hell? I was close once. Why don't you tell me what's really bothering you, Tracy? David and I are gonna have a baby. You spoil that kid every chance you get. I love you, honey. So much. Remember not to burden your audience with constant darkness in a story like this. Give them a little light. In any well-crafted screenplay, the protagonist wrestles with a question that will usually be answered at the end of the story. In Seven, it's Detective William Somerset that struggles over the theme. I just don't think I can continue to live in a place that embraces and nurtures apathy as if it was a virtue. Love costs, it takes effort and work. So the external world is relentless in challenging him to believe in the negative thematic argument that apathy is the easy choice. First, we have the police force. Neighbors heard them screaming at each other like for two hours, it was nothing new. Who gives a fuck? He's dead. His wife killed him. Anything else has nothing to do with us. Wait a minute, no one bothers with vital signs? Did I stutter? This guy ain't breathing unless he started breathing spaghetti sauce. So that's how it's done around here. The act itself has meaning. Come on. Somebody had a problem with a fat boy and decided to torture him. I don't understand this place anymore. It's the way it's always been. How do they get here so fucking quick? They pay police for the information. And they pay well. We're collecting all the evidence. Putting everything in the neat little piles and filing it away. On the off chance it will ever be needed in the courtroom. And finally, we have the civilians. Coupon, coupon, free coupon, discount. Well, in any major city, minding your own business is science. The first thing they teach women in rape prevention is never cry for help. Always yell fire. Well, let me tell you, people don't want a champion. They want to eat cheeseburgers, play the lotto, and watch television. Hey, how did you get like this? Well, you get numb after a while. But on the positive end of the argument, we have David and Tracy. They provide the light of humanity for William. It's William. Hmm. William, I'd like you to meet David. David, this okay. is good. All right, um, I understand you two were high school sweethearts. Mm-hmm. I knew on our first date that this was the guy I was going to marry. Really? Mm-hmm. Well, it's kind of rare nowadays, you know. I mean, that level of commitment. The only time Somerset laughs in the film is when he's with Mills. <laughs> I suppose so. 
So in the end, Somerset fights for Mills' soul. Give me your gun. She begged for her life, Detective. Shut up! She begged for her life. Shut up. And for the life of the baby inside of her. Shut up! Give me the gun, baby. We'll take care of him. Whatever he needs. And he gives us his final answer on the thematic argument. Ernest Hemingway once wrote, The world is a fine place and worth fighting for. I agree with the second part. There are two crucial setups in this story. We head into the finale with little time to squeeze in the final two deadly sins. There's a real danger of them being contrived to fit the big plot twist. But look at how they're set up beforehand. First, we have the setups for Envy. Hello. I admire you. I just had to call and express my admiration. Why us? He says he admires you. When I said I admired you, I meant what I said. You've made quite a life for yourself, detective. Mm. You should be very proud. I wish I could have lived like you did. Shut up. Do you hear me, detective? I'm trying to tell you how much I admire you and your pretty wife. What? Because I envy your normal life. Put the gun down, baby. It seems that envy is my sin. Oh, what's in the box? Then we have the setups for Wrath. We have to know that Detective Mills has the emotional constitution to fall for the trap. Fucking Dante. Goddamn poetry writing faggot piece of shit. Close crime scene. Get the fuck out of hey, here. I got a right to be here. Get out of here. Get out of here. Hey! Get out of here. I got a fucking right to be here. Get up. Get the fuck out of here. All right, I'm sorry. Also, it's important that they set up what Tracy means to him. Mills? Are you okay? Something wrong? How are the kids? They're good. They're in the room. Oh, good dog. Oh, good dog. David and I are going to have a baby. I love you, honey. So much. So now he's ripe for the picking. You're only alive because I didn't kill you. Okay, sit back. I spared you. Sit back, you fucking freak! Shut your fucking mouth! What's in the fucking box? She begged for her life, for the life of the baby inside of her. You lie! You're a fucking liar! Shut up! Become vengeance, David. Ah, she's all right, you tell me. Become wrath. In most detective stories with a serial killer, the villain is exceptionally powerful and cunning, testing the detectives to their limits. Seven is no different. Let's take a look at John Doe. This guy is methodical, exacting, and worst of all, patient. No fingerprints. Nope. Totally unrelated victims. Yep. And no witnesses of any kind. He cuts the skin off the tips of his fingers. That's why we couldn't find one single usable print in his apartment. Honestly, have you ever seen anything like this? No. Mills. My client also wishes to inform you that if you do not accept, he will plead insanity across the board. And we all know with the extreme nature of these crimes, I could get him off with such a plea. California, stay away from here. Whatever you hear, stay away. John Doe has the upper hand. Furthermore, the villain generally wants the same thing that the hero wants. In this case, it's Tracy. She's what's at stake in this dark city. I've been going around, you know, looking at schools. But the conditions here are horrible. I hate this city. Notice what the two detectives ask her every time she calls. Mills? Hmm. Are you okay? Something wrong? Hello, William. It's Tracy. Tracy? Is everything all right? So that's how John Doe most efficiently attacks the hero's weakness. I'm trying to tell you how much I admire you and your pretty wife. I took a souvenir, her pretty head. She begged for her life, detective. Shut up! And for the life of the baby inside of her. Shut up! 
And finally, the villain cannot be evil just for the sake of being evil. Never forget that he's the hero of his own story. In this movie, we know exactly what makes John Doe do what he does. I won't deny my own personal desire to turn each sin against the sinner. An obese man, a man who if you saw him while you were eating, you wouldn't be able to finish your meal. This is a man who dedicated his life to keeping murderers and rapists on the streets. So ugly on the inside that she couldn't bear to go on living if she couldn't be beautiful on the outside. A, a drug dealer, a, a drug dealing pederast actually. Only in a world this shitty. Could you even try to say these were innocent people and keep a straight face? So when you craft a bad guy in your story, don't forget what Alfred Hitchcock taught us. The more successful the villain, the more successful the picture. Here's one of the cardinal rules of storytelling. Keep the audience engaged. Always make them want to know what will happen next. Let's look at how the screenplay of Seven creates questions in the audience's mind, and how this makes us look ahead to a future point in the story, wanting to know the answer. First, we have questions that are left dangling without an answer. Why here? I don't follow. It's the first question that popped into my head. I guess the same reason as you. It's my wife. Sorry? She'd like to speak to you. Yes, thank you very much. On what? Give me your money. I'm giving you this, but for some strange reason, I think I don't know what the fuck we're doing. You will accept my apology, won't you? I feel like saying more, but I don't want to ruin the surprise. What? It doesn't have to be in dialogue, either. Look, I get this thing off of me! Then, we have declarations of future actions or outcomes. You know, we are all going to be real glad when we get rid of you, Somerset. You know that? Six more days and you're all the way gone. Won't be the first time you've left unfinished Those business. other cases were taken as close to conclusion as humanly possible. There are seven deadly sins, Captain. You can expect five more of these. Now, we're going to finish this thing up today, ladies and germs. Vic Let's take a look at him. Talk to him. You do the talker. I figure one of two things will happen. Either we'll get John Doe, or he'll finish his series of seven, and this case will go on for years. These two murders away from completing his masterpiece. We'll wait for his plea. He will take Detectives Mills and Somerset to these bodies, but only Detectives Mills and Somerset, only at six o'clock today. So, knowing this, let's see what they give us in the brilliant final act. So where are we heading? You'll see. We're not just going to pick up two more dead bodies, are we, John? You can't see the whole complete act yet. What time is it? Why? I'd like to know. Mills? I'm just delivering a package, man. I got this package for this guy, David. Uh, Detective David Mills. We got a box. We got a box! California, stay away from here. Whatever you hear, stay away. John Doe has the upper hand. Oh, what's in the box? Not till you give me the What's gun. in the fucking box? Give me the gun. That's what he wants. He, wa he wants you to shoot him. If you kill him, he will win. So remember, always keep the audience engaged, and you'll have them for the entire story. Hi, I'm Daniel Lee, creator of Script Sleuth. First, I want to thank my patrons for supporting me on Patreon. Your generosity helps keep the channel going. Thank you. If you're not a member yet, go to patreon.com slash scriptsleuth to get early access to videos, exclusive content not available to the public, and vote on films to cover next. Also, be sure to subscribe and tap the bell to be notified of upcoming videos. Thank you so much for watching.